So if you took Calvino's labyrinthine cities and Borges' vast library and Umberto Eco's historical mystery and Kafka's bizarre threat of oppression and Lovecraft's behemoth cosmic horror, then you're somewhere in the ballpark of Le Venti Giornate di Torino, The 20 Days of Turin. Hey now, hey now, now, sing this corrosion to me. I've had that stuck in my head for the last week. I love the Sisters of Mercy, and you know how it is when a song gets in there, it just will not leave. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. Great to see you, as always. Hope you're doing well. I've got something for you today. So if you took Calvino's labyrinthine cities and Borges' vast library and Umberto Eco's historical mystery and Kafka's bizarre threat of oppression and Lovecraft's behemoth cosmic horror, then you're somewhere in the ballpark of Le Venti Giornate di Torino, The 20 Days of Turin, by Giorgio de Maria. This is an Italian cult classic ghost story translated into English last year for the first time. It also functions as a social and political metaphor with an eerily accurate prediction of internet culture. It was originally published in 1977. So it's about a man from Turin who's researching and interviewing people about this event that happened called the 20 Days of Turin. It was a series of really grisly, violent, strange murders. I gotta say, I love books about books and books where the city is a character. This happens to be both. So our protagonist is interviewing people who were in the city uh, while these murders were taking place. At that time, people were suffering from this strange collective insomnia because of a place called the library. It was started in the wing of this sanatorium that's run by the church. Basically, it's a place where you can write your thoughts and read the thoughts of others. And you can pay to submit things, and you can pay to read things, and you can pay to figure out the authors. People begin to become obsessed with this voyeuristic oversharing, which often leads to stuff that's perverted or cruel, much like a certain platform we all use every day, all day. So they start worrying about it, and they develop insomnia, wandering around the city at night. And these murders happen in front of them, and it's like, it's as if they don't even see or they don't remember. It's like they're zombies or something, you know? And it's sort of like, you could, I suppose, you could look at it as like sort of a metaphor for fascism. Everybody just wants to turn away and pretend like stuff's not happening or, or, uh, um, uh, do, or domestic terrorism, I think, is actually the, the particular metaphor which uh, Maria was using for this, for this story. So after the murders, the library was apparently dismantled, but then disseminated through the city. It never died. Our protagonist sees people picking up trash on the street, like bums with cigarette butts, uh, notes out of trash cans, and then he starts doing it himself. Our narrator, who is unreliable, kind of in the Edgar Allan Poe fashion, begins experiencing the same symptoms he's researching about. It was written in 1976, but it's kind of a prophecy of Facebook, posting, the internet. The library is everywhere. You can't kill it. You can't even see it. And you can't take it back, just like you can't take back the stuff that you post online. And at first you might be like, uh huh, that's kind of clever, or it's like maybe you're reading into it too much, and it's, but, but then you, you think about it and it starts to become really eerie, really dis disturbing. You begin to recognize the prophecy of collective loneliness and isolation that, to some degree, we're all experiencing. So in classic mystery fashion, he meets with and interviews inhabitants of the city who experienced things related to the murders. At one point, he's discussing the origins of the library with a mayor, and I wanted to read this piece because I thought it was great. This is the narrator who asks the question, but isn't it possible that the library did reach one of its goals, to bring people closer together? Oh, it reached goals, quite a lot of goals, he said with a dash of sarcasm, but certainly not the goals you're talking about. Even those infamous contributions, those dialogues across the ether that were later purged by the library, helped break that cycle of loneliness in which our citizens were confined. Or rather, they helped to furnish the illusion of a relationship with the outside world. A dismal cop-out nourished and centralized by a scornful power bent only on keeping people in their state of continuous isolation. The inventors of the library knew their trade well. One of the people he meets with, this attorney, describes these screams that he heard. Uh, these warlike, inhuman screams. And another fellow managed to record the voices of some of these things. That's one of the most disturbing moments of the book, the descriptions of this recording. And if you've ever seen the movie Barbarian Sound Studio, I think that's what it's called, it was a film that was not an Italian horror film, but I believe it was 
inspired by Italian horror films uh, or, or it takes place in that era or something, but it's all about sound design for horror films and this guy who creates the, the grisly details for them and uh, uh, it definitely reminded me of that. As it's kind of a classic Lovecraft moment, I'm not going to spoil it for you. You really need to experience it yourself alone in the dark. You're welcome. At first in the narrative it seemed awkward and unfulfilled, like I was missing something or it was unfinished. It was, it, I couldn't really put my finger on it. But then writing the review it kind of so, sort of dawned on me. I, I really haven't figured it out quite yet, but it's, it's something like when you, when you realize that it's not realism but surrealism because you're led down a very different path initially than where you end up. You, you think it's, it's kind of a straightforward mystery at first, but it just devolves, but, it, but it's so subtle, you see, because where you start and where you end up are two very different worlds. He, he kind of misleads you into these places, he, he leads you off. Uh, you're sort of charmed by the atmosphere, and the, but gradually you get this sense of dread and this real, at, this real feeling of sickness, this atmosphere of like, of, of, of things just being wrong, like just like a, like a dream that's, it's a little Lynchian, you know, it's, it's like a dream where it's like almost everything's right, but then something's, you, you have this undercurrent that is just really not. <laughs> this, and then gradually it grows larger and larger and larger, almost like a, like a, like a, a, a deep pitch in a soundtrack and then, all, and then all of a sudden you realize that things are, oh yeah, real bad. Giorgio is not to be trusted because it's as if you're journeying into the mental illness of a man as he discovers more and more of the secrets behind these murders. By the end it's almost entirely Kafka-esque nightmare. But you're inhabiting the same world, the same city as you were previously. This gives the book a demented quality, this strange, sick feeling. Things are never quite right, they're always shifting. and. You know, that's what makes him a terrific writer, is he leads you down one way and he completely, uh, uh, completely changes it and, uh, and you're not aware of where you're being led. And uh, it's surprising, but it's, but almost after the fact, it's like the first time, you know, I want to reread it because I was sort of just like, what? You know, but then you, you backtrack and you think about it for a little bit, you let it digest and uh, yeah. These murders are committed by these hulking, warlike, cloaked figures, honing in on and choosing one of the shuffling insomniacs from the crowd of sleepless Turinis and literally smashing them, like picking them up, then grabbing their ankles and like wielding them like a club and smashing them. That's how the murders take place. At first it's comical, but then it's, you think about it for a while and you, you read the book and you're like, it's kind of demented, you know? It's, it, it, that, it's almost like that it doesn't work or that it's so awkward or clunky is sort of the, the creepy thing about it. So what are they, these, these figures, these, these giant uh, entities? We don't know. We never really find out. The hideous spawn of the devil, maybe Judgment Day as Roman Glasov, the translator discusses in the introduction, it's kind of up for interpretation. Manifestations of an embittered, doomed cosmos, that would definitely be the Lovecraftian element. Uh, it's not solved, it's never solved. We don't know why, we don't, there's no answer. That's my favorite kind of ghost story, but it, it's so much more than a ghost story, you know? The story is also in part a metaphor for terrorism of the era, this period referred to as the years of lead. There were a lot of politically extreme groups in Italy at that time. I don't know anything about the history, so I want to look into it further, but you know, you can, you can gather just from the title, you know, the years of lead. Uh, there, was some, there was some stuff going on. But you can see the, the metaphor, you know, these acts of terrorism that just spring up seemingly out of nowhere, just like the, these murders. But there's obviously some sort of conspiracy at work in the city of Turin. And in his research to write a book about these murders, he's getting too close to the answer. Giorgio de Maria was an author, a playwright, and a pianist. He passed away in 2009. Along with Italo Calvino and Umberto Eco, Maria started a musical group called the, and I'm probably going to butcher this, Canta Cronace, uh, which was a collection of musicians and poets who sought to enhance the world of song through social commitment. So they would take these folk songs and politicize them. They recorded resistance, socialist, and Italian Jacobine songs. Uh, it's interesting stuff. In the 80s, he had this artistic and spiritual crisis. Uh, uh, he was really suffering with some form of serious mental illness from what I gather. 
and he had a, a total, you know, I believe he was kind of uh, anti-clerical and, uh, you know, uh, what I imagine probably an atheist, but then uh, became a traditional Catholic, like had this whole total change and stopped writing novels. So I believe that the 21 Days of Turin was his last one, and then he became a Catholic, which was sort of like Wiesmal, although I don't know if Wiesmal stopped writing. Giorgio was an oddball, you know, eclectic and eccentric, wore many hats, I gather, and eventually had to reckon with a serious mental illness. So this Italian author who translates Stephen King named Giovanni Arduino called this a cursed book, and it's pretty accurate. In some ways, it seems to have predicted the dark parts of social media and the internet. It also seems to have ominously hinted at the culture of incels in this kind of wave of lone wolf terrorism, where lonely killers inspire other lonely killers to commit acts of extreme violence. It is like Italo Calvino mixed with Lovecraft. This labyrinthine Italian city is the backdrop for this inexplicable, bizarre violence. You get the sense that there's always a sinister presence in the city everywhere. There's this paranoia in the character that feels too real. You begin to wonder how much the book was hinting at what was to come from Maria in real life with his spiritual crisis. It's an Italian ghost story that feels like a Dario Argento film during the years of lead. But it's also a love letter to the landscape of Turin. It feels like a personal guided tour of madness, right? It would be a perfect read for somebody traveling to Turin. At least it would be for me, you know. Maybe this would be a horrible read for people going to Turin, but I would love it. You know, I would just map out the city because it lists all of these monuments and, and places and I would just go to each and every one of them uh, thinking about murder and darkness and, you know, what was it I said? Cosmic behemoth horror or something like that. Yeah, th th that's a perfect vacation for me. I'm going to go do that. And it has that eerie mystery quality, right? That it's all about books and research and history and kind of occult feeling stuff, conspiracy, religion. At one point, he's actually threatened by a nun who is affiliated with the church that supports the library to stop investigating the deaths. It's very, very similar to The Ninth Gate. And The Ninth Gate was based off of Arturo Perez Reverte's uh, um, The Club du Mas. So if you'd like me to review that, uh, give a thumbs up. It's not like heavy, heavy, challenging literary fiction. It's just fiction with these moments of kind of philosophical insight. Uh, it's, it's like a half and half. It's like a, it's like a, this is a terrific blend because it's a mystery, a ghost story, you know, very readable, straightforward fiction, but then it takes this turn, which is really experimental. Uh, like I said, very Kafka-esque. It really goes down its own path or, or I mean, it becomes very literary, you know, if you want to call it that. But it's very similar in atmosphere to The Ninth Gate and I love that film. There's even similarities in the story. For that reason, I suggest you listen to the soundtrack if you haven't had the pleasure by uh, Wojciech Kilar. I'll provide the link for you in the description box below. You have to listen to that soundtrack. Lots of strings, very dramatic, it's awesome. I think he did the soundtrack for Dracula too. I'm just in that mood. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Sisters of Mercy in the Ninth Gate. Oh, um, uh, nothing's changed since I was like 17. <laughs> There's some mystery and horror plot cliches like you might be able to guess some of the things that happen, but they're easily overlooked for the atmosphere. The story of the descent into madness reminds me of Suspiria or The Tenant. Definitely like a Roman Polanski or Argento film, totally. So who should read it? Anyone who loves Poe, Lovecraft, Borges, Calvino, uh, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, Mysteries, you know, better than food. Now who's gonna get it? Time for the coffee lottery. For those of you that are new, the Coffee Lottery is where I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show, and I place their names in this mason jar, I pull out a name for every review, and I send whoever, whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book plus a bag of coffee I roast myself. And the coffee is delicious. I was just drinking an Americano. If you would like to get in on that and support the show, you can head to the description box below and click the link or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you so much. $1 or more per video will get you access to the patron only reviews and I'm going to review this other ghost story uh, by a certain Chilean author who I love and uh, it's one of my favorite stories of all time. It's a ghost story, but it's very, very, very funny. Thank you very much to the new patrons and good luck to everyone. All right, here we go.
Luke, thank you so much for the support, Luke. Really appreciate it. You're going to get the 20 days of Turin. And I think you're in Chicago, so maybe I'll just deliver that personally, since I'm gonna be there soon. So, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're also gonna get some delicious coffee. I'll just bring it to you. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, neighbor. Please subscribe if you have not already. Also, a like on Facebook would be great. I realize the irony of that, given today's content. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Always remember, die reading. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.